something that is internal, kind of the essence of the essence. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ يَا أَوْلِي الْأَلْبَابَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Similar ayah that, O oh, you who have minds, have taqaw of Allah so that you can achieve success. Now here, before we continue, kind of there is a not so subtle difference here between uh, the word aqil in the Arabic language and the word dhaki. So if a person is dhaki, he's intelligent. Right? Like you're good, at, good in school. Smart. Right? I don't know if English has these shades of meaning or not. It's possible. But aqil is different than that. Huh? Aqil, if, even if in the vernacular, the slang, the people use. If a boy is rambunctious, right? Disorderly. What do they tell him? Be aqil. Right? Be aqil, right? They don't mean be smart. So that's not it, but we be what? Wise. Be reserved. That's what they mean by it. Be aqil. Yani have aqil and sit down. Have aqil and settle. So aqil means the thing that restrains. That's what, that's what it means. The thing that restrains. And so the mind was called aqil because it restrains you from doing things that are wrong and foolish. Right? And as long as it restrains you, you have aql. If it doesn't restrain you, you don't have aql. Though you could be very smart. You could be very, very smart. But if you do all the wrong things because the mind is not mature enough to restrain you, you don't have aql. And you could be a person of average intelligence, average IQ, but you're very good in avoiding what's wrong and what is haram and foolishness, then you have aql. So, there's this connection between the two, and that will be helpful, inshallah, in answering some questions about how could you have someone who is so smart, but at the same time so foolish, and someone who is not as smart as him, but he is wiser. He says, because these two things are not always correlated. They don't come together. You could be very smart, but you misuse your mind, and you could be very smart and very evil at the same time, right? So you wouldn't be called aqil. So Ibn al-Qayyim is saying sins diminish the mind and he's going to tell you why first religiously. So he says, وَكَيْفَ يَكُونُ عَاقِلًا وَافِرَ الْعَقْلِ مَنْ يَعْصِ مَنْ هُوَ فِي قَبْضَتِهِ So he says, how can a person be of sound mind, have aql, right? While you're disobeying someone and you're under his dominion, you're under his power, you're in his home, in his house. Again, the same meaning. You know that he sees you. And you're under his watch, you can't hide from him. And you're using his favors to disobey him. And every time you're incurring his curse and his uh, punishment. And like every time when you sin, you're inviting the punishment of one who has power over you and can do whatever he wants to you. Right? And every time you're inviting his curse and to be dismissed from his presence and to let go of you and to let go you know, and not protect you from your enemy. And for you to be denied his mercy and his love and to be comforted next to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to win his ultimate paradise and looking at his face in addition to everything else he gives to those whom he, whom he loves and he protects them from everything that he hates. So he says, if you're doing this to yourself while you are in his presence, inviting his worship, how could you be called intelligent? And he says, then adds to it. So what mind or sound mind could be attributed to someone who favors the joy or the comfort of an hour or a day huh, in an infinite or semi-infinite number of days or hours that will pass as if it's a dream and favor that over of everlasting comfort in paradise. He says, how could you be intelligent if you do this? So two things here he's talking about. One, you are opposing Allah Azza wa Jal in front of him. And you know what he had promised those who oppose him, that he's going to punish them. And you know, you believe that that is coming. And you continue to oppose him. So he says, how could this be intelligent? And how could you be a sound of mind? Like somebody who is driving 
and he knows that he's driving so fast, ultimately he is crashing. He knows for sure he's crashing because he can see the end and he doesn't hit the brakes. You wouldn't look at that person and you say that that person is of sound mind because you're driving towards your end. You're killing yourself. He says, this is what is happening. You know you're killing yourself. You know you're driving yourself into hellfire, yet you keep doing it. And he's watching you, and you know that he is watching you, and you know that you cannot escape him. And he sends you from time to time reminders that what you're doing is wrong, and you still don't pay attention to it. He says, how could this be a person of sound mind? How could he be called intelligent? And he says, right? So he said, and if not for the fact that we know that he has a sound mind by which he is able to process and understand the evidence and the proofs of Allah Azza wa Jal by which he becomes liable and responsible. Meaning like this person who is disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. Is he culpable before Allah Azza wa Jal? You say yes. Why? Because he understands the Quran and understands the Sunnah and understands Allah's evidence. So he's not insane, right? You say yes, he's not insane. At the same time he's saying he's acting in such a way that he should be an insane person. If not for the fact that we know that he's intelligent because he understands, we would call him insane for acting this way for killing himself, for losing or compromising his future, right? But he said, but the insane are better than he is, which is true, by the way. The, those who have lost their minds are better than that person. So imagine Allah Azza wa had given you such a gift and you are worse than the people who were denied that gift. Why are the insane better off than this person? Because they could argue on the day of judgment, I, I did not understand a thing. I'm not responsible, right? I'm not responsible. So Allah Azza wa could test them, Allah could forgive them. But they didn't have the mind, the faculty to understand and to avoid wrong and to do right. You have it, but you ignore it. So that's worse than the person who has no intelligence at all. So imagine how a person here... As Allah, as Allah Azza wa Jal says, بَدَّلُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ كُفْرًا They have changed the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal. They've changed the ni'mah of Allah until he became worse than the people who does, the person who does not have it, or he become worse than an animal. Because at least an animal at a basic level, they know Allah Azza wa Jal, and an animal also, and they know danger, they run away from it. But you know danger and you run towards it, he says, you cannot be an intelligent person that way. So, so on a religious level, you understand how sin diminishes intelligence because you wouldn't and shouldn't be acting this way. So this is kind of in one area, the religious area. This is how sin diminishes the mind. He says, He says, as for diminishing or the sin diminishing of the mind related to worldly affairs. So as far as religious affairs are concerned, you understand how and why. Then when it comes to worldly affairs, how does it diminish it or why does it diminish it? He says, He says, if not for the fact that sin is so widespread, sin is so widespread that is so common among everybody, the obedient among us would see the difference and how, how they are different from the disobedient. The obedient among us will see how diminished the mind and the intelligence of the sinful, sinful's mind are. You follow what I'm saying? So he says, if not for the fact that sin is so widespread that everybody is guilty of it, a lot of people are guilty of it. If not for the fact that this is happening, the obedient will be able to be very distinct from the disobedient people in intelligence, even in worldly affairs. Not only in religious, but even in worldly affairs. But he says, But the calamity is widespread, is common. And insanity or foolishness has a variety of paths in it. Meaning people 
disobey Allah Azza wa in so many ways that all of them have diminished minds. And that's why you don't see a variety, a difference, a clear difference between the righteous having a sound mind and the, the sinful having a diminished mind. Because they are closer to each other than should be. Right? Now, this answers a question, perhaps. Okay? If, if what I said is not clear, the example will help, inshallah. This answers a question. If this is true, how come the Muslims are not smarter than the non-Muslims? Right? Because if a person hears this, the obedient have better minds than the sinful. The righteous have better minds than the sinful. The Muslims are not superior in intelligence when compared to the non-Muslims. So how do you reason this out? How do you explain this? Well, first Ibn al-Qayyim, what he's talking about here, answers it. Which is what? Are the Muslims living today generally obedient to Allah Azza wa That they should see a stark difference between their sound mind and the non-believers? Are they that devout? He says, no, we're not. So when you're looking at Muslims, even if a non-Muslim is asking this question, or a Muslim is asking this question, they say the comparison, if you want a comparison, compare the best of you to the best of us. But today, when you look at Muslims, whether Muslims in Muslim countries or Muslim in non-Muslim countries, the practice of Islam is very light. How many people pray? Majority or minority? Minority. And that is the most essential thing in Islam, which is salah. Now add to this zakah, add to this hajj, add to this staying away from haram, which is very common. And you see what Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, is talking about. That is the calamity is so widespread, meaning that sin has diminished the mind of everybody, that you don't see a stark difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. That's why. But if the righteous were really righteous, you will see how sound their judgment is. You will admire them. You'll admire their decisions. You will admire their speech. You'll admire their advice and counsel. But the reason why you don't see such a huge difference is because we are closer to each other than should be. We have, we have a light or um, weak practice of Islam which diminishes our minds as well. So when you're talking, I'm talking about an average Muslim. You talk to an average Muslim, he doesn't sound very different from a non-Muslim. Their basics are there, right? But in terms of lifestyle, in terms of opinions, in terms of uh, social, cultural practices, they're not very different from a non-Muslim. That's why the difference is not very big. But you want to understand what he's talking about and the transformation that you know, righteousness brings? Look at the Sahaba of the Prophets. The Prophet The Sahaba were completely transformed. From people in the beginning that before Islam, no one paid attention to them. Right? They had nothing that people wanted. They were not invaded. Right? Like Empires were not interested in that area. Yes, it was a difficult area to control and they were tribal. So it is very hard to subjugate that, yes. And it do doesn't have any resources in it. Yes, that's true. But also like for people, people dismissed them. They had nothing. And the Prophet ﷺ comes to those people who used to kill their daughters, used to make idols with their own hands and then worship that. And when they get tired of them, just take them apart. Right? They used to kill each other. They used to behave in a very so, uh, stupid and fo foolish ways. And the Prophet ﷺ comes and they get transformed into not only better people, but the best of people. And they have what? They have now a, when they come out to humanity, they have a message. They have a social program. They have an economic program. They have a moral 
a complete moral structure with them. When they speak, their wisdom surpasses the wisdom of the philosophers. People learn from them. They don't need to learn from anybody else. How did this all happen within the span of 20 years or so? That's it. It's not their children. It is they who that had that happen to them. You didn't have to wait another generation. But how was their mind, how was it um, advanced to such a degree? He says, it is obeying Allah Azza wa Jal and imbibing and absorbing the wisdom that you find in the Quran and then directly from Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. That's how they were transformed. So if a person sins, it's affect their mind. They become stupider because of it. Even if you were to admire a non-believer, right? So you suppose that you're listening to a non-believer. Suppose that they're highly educated um, with, you know, uh, this honor and that honor and that recognition and these papers, the, the best of the best, the smartest of the smartest. The people who, when they speak, they impress you the choice of words and the theories that they use and what have you. Listen to them, but keep listening to them. And especially if you're armed with wisdom from the Quran and the Sunnah, listen to them. They'll impress you in one area, yes. But keep listening to them and you'll see how quickly they fall. When they start talking about other things, talk about other fields, talk about especially moral right and wrong. Huh? how a person is supposed to live. You'll see the difference between what you've admired and how quickly they sink into opinions and in areas you know very well it's wrong. But they can't see it, but you can. And you don't see it because you somehow are super intelligent. You see it because you're leaning on the Quran that is teaching you. And on the Sunnah that is teaching you. And the greater your dependence on the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the smarter that you become. And the wiser that you become. Until you become the wisest of the wise. But if you what? Open yourself to it. And if you truly obey Allah Azza wa Jal, and you are guided by the light that Allah Azza wa Jal sends to his servants, then Allah completes your mind. Allah completes your mind. So when we're talking about people who are smart, don't bring me a non-Muslim who's a great mathematician and a Muslim who's farmer and tell me he is smarter than him. If that Muslim is righteous versus someone who is not advanced in secular knowledge, but when it comes to believing in Allah, جل, he denies him. Comes to believing in the prophets of Allah, he denies it comes to believing in the afterlife, he denies it. Comes then to believing in a stable right and wrong, fixed right and wrong, he's a relativist. No, there's nothing stable. You can you compare this to someone who believes in Allah and in the Prophet and the last day and he knows right from wrong and he's committed to it? So the mind here is not simply IQ. The mind here is what Allah had given you, which is a sound mind that you use to stay away from wrong and to do what is right. The other things that are gifts from Allah Azza wa Jal, you're smart, you're great in economics, in chemistry, biology, whatever it is, that's a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. But that does not elevate you with Allah Azza wa Jal. This is just like having a healthier body or a different skin color. That does not matter. What matters is how you use it. So, if Muslims in Muslim countries and in Muslims living in non-Muslim countries, if they were closer to Allah Azza wa you will find that they would be doing better individually and collectively. And you will know the difference between how they think and how the non-believers think. But we are thinking exactly how the non-believers think. And that's why you don't see a difference between us and them. Ibn al-Qayyim then continues. And he said, he just wants to contrast here between how could you have a sound mind and favor this world over the hereafter. So he says, if the minds were actually sound, they know that the way to attain joy and happiness and comfort is in pleasing the one who gives all of that to you. 
Just if you want, and this is what you are seeking, and this is what every human being is seeking. What do you want from life? I want to be happy, right? I want to be comfortable. I want to avoid pain. That's what I want. He says, how do you get all of that? So who the one who gives it? To Allah Azza wa Jal. So how could you get it except through him? So if you think, you'll know that you have to appease Allah Azza wa Jal in order for you to be able to get, to get all of that. And that if you want to avoid pain, who is the one who controls all of it? Dispenses all of it. Pain and punishment when he's angry. Allah Azza wa Jal. So if you want to avoid all pain, then you please Allah and you avoid all pain then. And he says that in obeying Allah Azza wa Jal, you will get such comfort and such happiness and your heart will be alive and your soul will find joy and life will be sweet that if you measure this against you know all of the dunya all of the dunya will be less than it like all this world and all that it has to offer measure this or weigh this against the comfort that you receive from obeying Allah Azza wa Jal they say the comfort of obeying Allah will be greater so why would you favor a dunya that even when it comes to you, it comes to you mixed with pain? Whereas the believer avoids that. So he's saying that the believer has two types of joy. The religious joy. No one has it except the believer, right? And worldly joy as well, because you do get married and you do have children and you have money and you get hired, and you eat, and you drink, so Allah did not deprive you of that. So you get this. But he says, but wait a second, worldly joy typically always comes with pain. Always comes with pain, but as a believer, you're able to jump over that. Because you know that it doesn't last you. And you know that Allah will compensate you if you lose it. And you know that if you are patient with loss, Allah rewards you. So all the pain which is built into, like it's, it's part of the structure of this world. Whatever it gives you, it says here's some pain with it. Whatever it is, you like this big house? He says, yeah. He says, here it is, and some pain. Do you want kids? Having kids is sunnah, right? I'm not telling you not to. I'm not scaring you. You want kids? Here are some kids. And some pain. You want to get married? Yes, you should. Here's a spouse and here's some pain. It has to be. Okay, so what do I do? How do I run away from this? The only way that you can run away from that pain is through iman. Then you'll have the religious joy, meaning there is no greater joy than being close to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because it just gives you comfort. It's like somebody coming and telling you after you make a lot of dua, hey, by the way, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Because you've given it to Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So everything is going to be fine. Don't worry. But tomorrow may be worse, tomorrow this and that. Allah takes care of tomorrow. You don't worry about it. My kids, what could happen to them, my money, Allah takes care of them. Don't worry about it. So comfort just for being close to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is listening. I'm not alone. The Quran, when you read it, comforts you. The Sunnah, when you read it, comforts you. So there's this religious satisfaction. And when you come to the dunya, you have worldly satisfaction plus minus some or a lot of the pain that comes with it because Allah Azza wa Jal gives you immunity, protects you from it. The disbeliever, on the other hand, doesn't have them. He doesn't have that religious satisfaction and comfort, right? And when it comes to the dunya, they suffer because of it. There is sadness and there's anxiety because you don't know. I have it, but it's not going to continue to be mine. What if I lose it? So the greater success they achieve, the lonelier they feel. They be isolated. And there's always the threat of losing whatever they have. So that is a question to people who say, well, how come I see the non-believers, the non-Muslims, 
Um, they have all of the dunya and they're so happy. And I'm miserable. Right? Now I can't speak to your own misery. Right? I don't know why you are miserable. Although there's always challenges in living in this world. But it's the wrong perception when you look at the non-believers and you say they're happy. How do you know that they're happy? Tell me, how do you know? Social media, right? Or, you know, you know, the media has a piece on some of them and they're, you know, experiencing a ton of success at this moment. How do you know that they're happy? How do you know that they're not taking something to be able just to cope with that anxiety? Or feeling of being fake or undeserving of what they have or the fact that they could lose it. And the fact is that they will lose it, right? They have to lose it. So how do you cope with the fact that the way that you valued yourself and you saw yourself is through people's eyes. People know me and they love me. And now you have lost their love and attention. They're not interested in you anymore because you got older. Somebody came and they replaced you, right? So how do you cope with that? We've lived off what? People's praise and recognition. Now they're not interested in you anymore. And you're alone. So that's, that's very harsh. And unless you have Allah Azza wa to support that, it will crush you. Then alcohol, drugs, suicide, and all of this. So how could you look at someone like that and say he is happier or she's happier? But maybe that we are not pushing ourselves enough to be close to Allah Azza wa to feel the happiness that Ibn Qayyim is talking about. We kind of, we, we, we waver. We're in the middle somehow. We're not fully committed. So we lack a lot of the dunya and we have a little bit of religion. A lot of the dunya and a little bit of religion. And that makes us miserable. So we have not really surrendered completely to Allah Azza wa Jal. And we're not really have full into the dunya. You know, meaning with, with detachment from Allah Azza wa Jal. So if you want the beauty of this life and the next, be a believer. And Allah gives you the joy of this life minus its pain. Uh, or a lot of its pain, not minus all of its pain. And Allah Azza wa Jalla Ibn Al Qayyim uh, brings this ayah. He says, "In takunu ta'lamuna, fa innahum yalamuna kama ta'lamuna wa tarjuna min Allahi ma la yarjun." And Allah Azza wa Jalla is speaking here to the believers in the context of battle, battle, but it applies to our situation as well. So Allah is saying, if you are experiencing pain. They experience pain as you do, but you expect from Allah what they do not expect. And that you should consider a principle. If you are experiencing any kind of pain, they are experiencing pain, meaning Allah is talking about the non-believers. They also experience pain as you do. The difference between you and them is that you expect from Allah what they don't. So that should kind of mitigate that pain. That should mitigate that pain. It's not going to be as painful. So a believer who has, loses a child, but they know that Allah rewards them and they will see that child in the next life is unlike a non-believer who does not expect that any, there's going to be a reunion. They're not the same because you expect from Allah what they do not expect, right? So he says, how diminished is the mind of one who sells pearls and musk for feces. Like he's comparing this life and what it has to offer to feces. And what you're giving up is what pearls and musk. He says, how could you sell this for that? And if that happens, how could you be called a person who has a mind that you could be proud of? And you let go of the possibility of be having the company of the prophets and the shuhada and the salihin. And you want to be the companion of those whom Allah is angry with. The, the, the worst of humanity. So think about the worst of humanity. Do you want those to be your companions? Constant, eternal companions? Like Pharaoh and Qarun and Abu Jahl and people on this earth today that you look at and you say, you're the most despicable of the most despicable. Right? Then that they're killers and rapists and these are the people that you want to be with on the day of judgment and in hellfire, and you want to let go of the company of the righteous, he says, how could you be a person of a sound mind if you decide to do this to yourself? Right? But the problem is that we are being deceived by what? Tulul amal. Hope, extended hope. Somehow. And then false wishes. 
Oh yes, despite everything that I'm doing, right? Nothing will happen to me. I'm going to be okay at the end. And it's all wishful thinking. And it's the same thing with the bad practices in this life. Like you could be smoking, and you know how bad smoking is. But there is a disconnect, there is a dissonance between what I'm doing and what it leads to. Like I'm exempt and I'm immune. You know, I'm not going to get cancer because I'm smoking. How? There's no, that, there's that dissonance. There's the break in reasoning. So a person who looks at you, hears that argument, knows that you're not smart when you say this. You're making yourself stupid because of what? Your own weakness, your own temptation, your own desire. It's making you stupid. So you have to admit that you're stupid. Nobody wants to admit that, but you have to admit that you're stupid when you reach that conclusion. Yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to drink alcohol, but I'm not going to become an alcoholic. Right? I'm going to watch pornography, but I will not be addicted to it. I will sleep around, but, be, but, but whenever I want to, I'll stop and I'll find a righteous spouse. You will be deserving of a righteous spouse, that Allah would give you a righteous spouse after messing up like that. How do you think? How is this the right mind? But how, why are you thinking so stupidly and acting so stupidly? So what is affecting you? Or what is infecting you? Is that, that sin? Otherwise, you'll be much wiser than that. So if you want, if Allah Azza wa had given you a good mind, a good head on your shoulders, don't waste it. By disobeying Allah Azza wa Then he's going to take that mind away from you. But in fact, perfect it by obeying him and being a good Muslim, and reading the Qur'an, and understanding it, and reading the Sunnah, and understanding it, and then you'll see how your mind will flourish until it will be better than the minds of those who were perhaps born smarter than you. Right? That's how, just like you exercise your body, and you become stronger, and you exercise your mind, and you become stronger as well. And he says, and also from the punishment of sin, is that, تُوجِبُ الْقَطِيعَةَ he says, it will disconnect a person from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when a person is disconnected, meaning there's a severance between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the causes of everything good will diminish or stop. And causes of all evil will be connected to him. So if you are away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the good that is supposed to come to you will cease. And all the evil that was supposed to be away from you will come your way. Because this is your position then, when you are severed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, so what prosperity and what hope a person could have if the connection between him and his creator is severed? The one that you cannot live without for a blink of an eye. The one that you cannot live without for a blink of an eye. You must have him. And there is no substitute for him. Right? Now physically, this is very evident. And it's, it's important to understand it physically to be able to appreciate it spiritually. So if Allah Azza wa Jal decides for a minute that He's going to let go of you, what happens to you? You end. Right? You completely end. You don't exist anymore. So you only exist, not only breathe. Of course, you breathe and you're alive and you can see because Allah Azza wa Jal maintains it. Every fraction of second. Right? And when he decides that stop, you're not going to live anymore, you die. If he decides that you're not going to eat, you're not going to eat anymore. If you decide that you're not going to drink, you're not going to drink anymore. Even though it's there, you can't process it. You can't digest it. So if Allah Azza wa lets go of you, you perish, you end. You're a non-existent thing anymore. You're not a thing. So how often do you need Allah Azza wa Permanently, without interruption. Okay. Spiritually, how often do you need Allah Azza wa Jal? The same way. Permanently. Because if not, your heart dies. If, you, if not, then evil connects to you. So Allah Azza wa has to protect you all the time. Otherwise, the shaitan will take over. As he will say now, the shaitan will take over. So Allah has to protect you all the time. And for you, for your heart to be alive, it needs to be fed. Right? 
Like the heart itself, as long as, I mean, as long as you're not asleep, when you wake up, what do you do? You start searching for things to do, to consume. So your heart is always consuming something, thinking about something, processing images, sounds, talking to someone, listening to them, walking somewhere. There's always something that you're processing. So the heart always needs something. And if what the heart is consuming is evil, is bad, just like bad food, it turns out to be bad as well. You'll find that your heart is tight. It's very tight. And it continues to be like this until you, you, know, you lash out, you scream at people, you can't tolerate anything. Then you get into all those mental health issues or what have you. Because the heart is what? Unsustained. But if you feed your heart well, it'll be a wholesome, healthy heart. So what feeds it? What's the only food that can feed it so that it can be such a heart? It's the remembrance of Allah Azza wa That's the only thing. The heart is created for that. And it's not your spouse, it's not your children, although they could elevate your mood, but it's not they that feed the heart. Allah Azza wa is the one who feeds it. So if you are disconnected from Allah Azza wa Jal, then you're disconnected from everything that is good. And you need Allah to sustain you physically and spiritually, to protect you, to guide you, and to protect you from all evil. So if you're severed, it will bring pain and agony and distress. And you may not be able to name it. You may not be able sometimes to detect its source but that's the source. It's a disconnect from Allah Azza wa Jal. So he said, Qala ba'du salaf, some of the salaf have said, I, I see that the servant of Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning any human being, is between Allah and the shaitan. Meaning somehow in the middle between Allah Azza wa Jal and the shaitan. If Allah Azza wa Jal turns away from him, the shaitan overtakes him. And if Allah Azza wa Jal is his ally, comes close to him, the shaitan cannot defeat him won't be able to get close to him. So you're like in between. So if Allah turns away from you, or you want to flip that, you say you turn away from Allah Azza wa Jal, because then what are you running towards? There's one direction only, the shaitan. So if you turn away from Allah, you want to know, run away from this, you're running towards the shaitan. And if the shaitan catches you, what will the shaitan do to you? Destroys you. You'll become miserable. Like he is, and he will say, he is your enemy. So you're running towards your enemy. So if your enemy gets you, or the enemy hates you, what will your enemy do to you? Torture you. Slowly torture you, right? So that's what the shaitan will do, torture you, right? You'll start seeing nightmares. You'll start seeing evil thoughts and whispers into your head. Things just don't go right. Have no patience, no tolerance. Uh, no good character. You don't know how to deal with people. They don't even know how to deal with you. Everything is wrong. Everything is wrong. Because you ran towards the shaitan and the shaitan now is in control. But if you run towards Allah Azza wa he protects you from the shaitan. So Ibn Qayyim, he brings this ayah in Surah Al-Kafi. He says, When we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam, they prostrated. Except for Iblis, he was from the jinn. And so he departed or he uh, fled from the obedience of Allah Azza wa from the command of Allah. So Allah is saying, so do you take him and his progeny as allies instead of me? And they are your enemies? Are they, you, do you take Iblis and his progeny as your allies and they are your enemy? So Allah, he says, Ibn Qayyim explaining it, he says, Allah Azza wa in effect, he's telling his servants, he says, I honored your father, and I elevated him. And I asked the angels to prostrate to him. And they did, and they obeyed me. But my enemy and your enemy refused. And he disobeyed me. And he exited from my obedience. So how, after all of this, how is it possible for you to take him and his progeny as allies instead of me? So you obey him and you disobey me. And you ally him to be against me. And he is your worst enemy. So you took him, your enemy, as a friend, and I commanded you to be enemies of his. 
And he said he is woman wala a'da al maliki kana huwa wa a'da'uhu indahu sawa. He says, if you take the enemies of the king as your friends, then your the king is also your enemy. Right? This is not possible that if you love that king or you love anyone, love anyone, and they have an enemy, and that enemy is your friend, well, it says something about your feelings towards that person then. They can both be your friends. So if the king has an enemy, and you know that he is his enemy, and you love the king, how could you ally yourself with the enemies of the king? Right? فَإِنَّ الْمَحَبَّةَ وَالطَّاعَةَ لَا تَتِمُّ إِلَّا بِمُعَادَةِ أَعْدَاءِ الْمُطَاعِ وَمُولَيَةِ أَوْلِيَاءِ He says his love, love and obedience is incomplete until you take as enemy the enemy of your beloved. And you take as ally the allies of your beloved. Meaning, you love someone. You love the ones that they love and you hate the ones that they hate. That's when love is complete. But love is incomplete when you say, I love him but I'm neutral about his enemies. And I'm neutral about his friends. He said that's an incomplete type of love. That's not real love. Especially when it comes to Allah Azza wa Jal. So he says if that's true, add to it too that this, the enemy of the king is also your enemy. It's not just an enemy of the king, he's also your enemy as well. And the enmity between you and him is greater than the enmity between the sheep and the wolf. Right? So how... Could an intelligent person, a smart person, do this to himself? So what is he saying? He's saying that the shaitan is the enemy of Allah Azza wa Jal and also is your enemy. How could he become your ally? How would you listen to him? Right? And then he continues and he said, وَيُشْبِهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ تَحْتَ هَذَا الْخِطَابِ نَوْعٌ مِنَ الْعِتَابِ لَطِيفٌ عَجِيبٌ He says, and also kind of embedded in this um, speech of Allah Azza wa Jal is kind of a soft, gentle blame. There's a blame, but it's soft and gentle. And he says, "What? What is what?" He says, "I've taken Iblis as if Allah is say, as if Allah is saying, I've taken Iblis as an enemy, because he did not prostrate to your father Adam with the angels. So I've took him as an enemy because of you. So the consequence of that is that you consider him a friend." After he has done what he has done to you and me. Right? Meaning Iblis, he's saying as if. Iblis was so high. Up there. And I asked him to prostrate to your father. But he refused. And because he refused to honor your father. I dismissed him from Jannah. I did this for you. And if I did this for you. The consequence of my act is for you to go back. And consider the enemy of your father. Who wants your destruction. Your enemy. Uh, your friend. Can I, is this how you're supposed to repay me for what I did? So there's kind of a itab, he says, kind of a soft claim that this all was done for you. You should be grateful for it and not turn towards the shaitan. So if a person is disconnected from Allah Azza wa Jal, he should expect that he should find less and less good in his life in proportion to how disconnected he is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And greater, and greater evil in his life that grows with the place that he gives to the shaitan in his life. So al to the severance between the servant of Allah Azza wa Jal and his creator cannot be maintained. If a person wants to live a life that is pleasing and that is comfortable, and if he wants to be protected from the shaitan, it cannot be maintained. So a person, whenever he notices a disconnect between him and Allah Azza wa Jal, he bridges that as best as he can. And that distance could be a distance of sin or a distance of ghafla, negligence, meaning I just forgot. I just delayed my salah. I just forgot to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. I kind of unintentionally or intentionally did a little bit of haram here and there. That's a disconnect. So you bridge it by coming to Allah Azza wa Jal to experience the comfort and serenity of being next to Him. Otherwise, it keeps growing and growing. And the shaitan will have greater and greater hold on you until you discover after some time that his hold is so great, it's hard to escape. It's really hard to escape. You need, just like a person who does not 
treat or notice the early signs of an illness and you let it grow until it becomes hard, not impossible, but hard to treat. So there's a lot that needs to be done to be old in order to treat it. So that's why the disconnection from Allah Azza wa whenever you notice it, bridge it and come back to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So let me stop here with Allah Azza wa and see if you have questions. And next week, inshallah, as we've decided, will be the halaqa will be just for next week at 7.30, inshallah. Right? So before Maghrib, and that will give you, inshallah, some time in order, inshallah, if you want to make dua as well. Um, let me see if you have questions. Let me know, inshallah. No. So you said indulgence in what? I'm sorry. In, in, in all sorts of yes, yes, yes. Exactly. So uh, the, the question is that when you look at the world today, you see such um, indulgence in, in sin, all types of sin. Um, and that somehow could be connected to an increased uh, suffering of reporting of mental health issues. So are they connected, meaning this overwhelming uh, an abundance of sin, the practice of it, that it is easily accessible, versus people having such discomfort internally, or even though they have all the means of comfort. Like physically, we are much more comfortable today than we were before. Uh, we don't worry as much as people before about the next meal. So we have less of a reason to worry or to be sad, but it seems like you have more instances of dissatisfaction. Even in the richest countries in the world, people complain about money and lack of money. The richest, right? It's not like they are the poorest. In the Western countries where they have, uh, yeah, among the greatest GDPs in the world, people still complain about not having enough money. So you could add that to it. Is this connected to sin? And we say it must be. It must be a reflection of that. Because if a person is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they don't have a lot around them, they'll be at least be content on the inside. And they'll be patient. And they'll rely on Allah azza wa And these are the tools of um, serenity and being at ease and in peace. But when you delve into this sin and that sin, by the way, they are by nature unsatisfying, right? They're by nature are unsatisfying. So if you uh, consume one type of haram, after some time you get bored with it, right? It's not enough, because it doesn't excite you anymore. So you move into something else, something stronger. Uh, and, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. And so on, as Ibn al-Qayyim before talked about it, he says, with the haram now, you're drowning your sorrows. So you start to drink or take drugs, not just so you enjoy them now, because you don't want to drown your sorrows. You want to stop thinking. And so bad breeds, of course, and add to it, of course, add to it, that the shaitan now is saying, well, I'm going to be seated to your right and to your left, and in front of you and back. I'm everywhere. So he's inside your head, and it's inside your mind and inside your body. So, of course, a person will experience greater anxiety and greater sadness and greater friction and greater anger and much more intense whispers in their mind. And so that is the dominion of the shaitan. That is the dominion of the shaitan. Whereas the believer 
has less and less of that. It doesn't mean that the shaitan does not come to whisper for the believer. Does he whisper? But you have the tools. You know what to do with it. But the non-believer, what does he do with the whispers of the shaitan? They have no clue that it's a whisper, by the way. They don't believe in him, right? But you know what to say, and you know what to do, and you know how to stop it. And if not, you can ask. And so you can contain his effect, or you can kind of dismiss him completely. But for the non-believer, it's very difficult. So the prevalence of um, social problems and psychological problems is in a large part due to this, which is the prevalence of sin. And when Allah Azza wa says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى So the one who turns away from my remembrance will give him a difficult life. That difficult life could mean a difficult life in the grave. And also could mean a difficult life in this life. When you turn away from Allah Azza wa his remembrance, you'll have a difficult life in this life. And you will have a sweeter or easier life when Allah is beside you. So the difficulty of that life is because your life is always incomplete unless Allah is next to you. And as unless Allah is assuring you and is giving you the answers to the questions that you need. But take Allah away. The simple question of what's going to happen to me tomorrow and who will take care of me? What's the answer? I have money, but what if, what if I lose all my money tomorrow? What's the answer? I have a job, right? What if you lose your job tomorrow? Which is possible, right? What if you lose your job tomorrow? How will you pay your bills? What's the answer? Now when the shaitan comes to you with that, as a believer, what do you say? If you remember, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is no living thing on this earth except that its provision is upon Allah Azza wa Jal. You say, then Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal has promised that he has provisions for me. Halas, okay, that's fine. Alhamdulillah. You could be fine then. But a person who does not have that answer, what do they do? They keep thinking and thinking and thinking until they make themselves sick. So there is no answer. And the shaitan comes and says, yes, 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 indeed, yes, yes. He feeds it, he feeds it, he amplifies it, and he feeds it. So you become sicker because of it. So yes, you're right. The prevalence of mental health issues and psychological problems is due, in, in our opinion, as people who... Believe in Allah Azza wa Jal is due to a lack of belief in Allah. Yeah. No, I mean, that could relate what you're talking about, because you're talking about, um, I think the, the question will become apparent through the answer, inshallah. So you're talking about kind of the non-believers uh, happy with whatever portion of life that they have, right? That could be related to the diminishment of mind that we're talking about. So those who disbelieve, they are enjoying this life and they eat just like animals do. So their intelligence has diminished to a level where they're simply satisfied with that. As long as we have fun and as long as we eat, we're happy. So it's more of an animalistic existence, even though I still consider it to be unfair to the animals because the animals still know Allah Azza wa Jal, right? It's really they know Allah Azza wa Jal, but these people don't. They don't really care. Although they have access to all that information. So... Their minds is just what had been, um, had been really diminished, had been uh, weakened to the extent of as long as I can eat and drink and party, that's fine. That's it. I don't need anything else. They're not deep thinkers. So a lot of non-Muslims are like that. And that's why you find them to be happy because they're just simply focused on the uh, kind of the body, just the joy of the body. 
But with all of that, what we said is true. With all the happiness that they bring, there must come a lot of pain with it, a lot of worry with it. He can't, he can't simply think that sleeping with someone, zina, is so exhilarating, is so fascinating, and do it, and once you're done, think it's not gonna affect you. It's not gonna leave you with a lot of pain, a lot of regret, a lot of shame. It has to happen. And, phys and, and also, eventually, physically, it also will catch up with you. There has to be something that's gonna be left with you, a disease of some sort, right? Or a psychological issue of some sort that stays with you because you are disobeying Allah Azza wa like that. So they've been diminished intellectually and that's why they could live like that. But if a person is a deep thinker, they say, okay, why am I doing all of this and I'm gonna die anyway? What is the value of life if someone can end my life tomorrow? So what, why am I doing all of this? If they are a deep thinker, they will be deeply troubled because of all of these questions. And they will be exhausted and debilitated because there is no answer unless they believe in Allah Azza wa He's the only answer. So this is why believing in Allah Azza wa kind of um, improves your mind but also improves your spirit. Whereas if you decide not to believe, you'll be dumber and dumber as long as you take worse and worse choices. Allah. What is the other part? Naam. Naam. Zakallah khair. Naam. So that one. Naam. You're right. I mean, you will find in several hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, as if the Prophet is redirecting the Sahaba to focus less on worldly joy and more, more on otherworldly joy. So, yani, there's a hadith that kind of sums it. يعني من كانت الدنيا من كانت الأخيرة همه كفاه الله أمر الدنيا. It is if the hereafter is your concern, is that what you're worried about? Allah takes care of your worldly concerns. But if your worldly, the, your concern is the worldly concern, then whatever you're worried about would be scattered in front of you, and you will have to toil, strive, struggle to be able to get it. And even when you do that, the only thing that you will get is what Allah had destined for you. So your life will be difficult because of it. Whereas if your concern is the hereafter, Allah brings it to you, the dunya to you. Allah. I think inshallah we'll stop here bi Allah azza wa jal. We'll meet you 7.30 inshallah next week. Zakumallah khaira. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu illa ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka.